I hope this is not the root cause of Dali power loss, because if this is the case, then the captain and chief engineer will go to jail and pay heavily the consequences. Hi everyone, if you are new here, my name is Mustafa and I'm a captain on board ships with size similar of Dali. I will not go deep in the technical side, I will leave this to be covered by our chief engineers out there in this video, which is the third one of Dali series in my channel. These are the others. We'll discuss as usual the regulations that govern this and why this particular cause would lead to the power loss resulting the ship aligning with the key bridge. Let's start with some definitions. Blackout. Blackouts, propulsion limitation, total loss of propulsion, and loss of steering capability are all serious incidents. When they occur during navigation in open waters, they increase the risk to the vessel and personnel, but rarely resulting in dangerous or life-threatening outcomes. However, if they occur when navigating close to a coast during heavy weather or when maneuvering in restricted areas such as traffic lanes, entering or leaving ports, these risks become critical and may result in major casualty. Before proceeding further, let's define two terms, blackout and dead ship, because they are not the same. According to this circular from Maritime Safety Committee, MSC, which is an interpretation of this regulation from SOLAS. Blackout means an initiating event to a dead ship condition. A blackout situation means that the main and auxiliary machinery installations, including the main power supply, are out of operation, but the services for bringing them into operation, for instance, compressed air, starting current from batteries, etc., are available. And according to this circular from Maritime Safety Committee, MSC, which is an interpretation of this regulation from SOLAS, it is the condition under which the main propulsion plant, boilers and auxiliaries are not in operation due to the absence of power. In addition, no stored energy for starting and operating the propulsion plant. The main source of electrical power and the essential auxiliaries is assumed to be available. Possible causes of main engine failure. Of course, this is electrical failure. They start with electric components first. Currently, the NTSB called the vessel builder Hyundai Heavy Industries to investigate the cause of power, but there are multiple causes. The main causes of propulsion loss by the London PNI Club members and for which PNI investigation was required during a specific period of time are as follows. By the way, protection and indemnity or PNI Club is non-governmental, non-profitable, mutual or cooperative association of marine insurance providers to its members which consists of ship owners, operators, charterers, and seafarers under the member companies. Anyway, so 29% of causes are from insufficient or ineffective maintenance, 24% human error, another 24% equipment failure, 17% fire, and 6% other causes. So generally, the possible causes of blackouts are by hundreds, but we can define the most probable. Human error. Closing valve that should not be closed or stopping an equipment which is essential for vessel power. Failure of starting air. High or excessive numbers of engine starts and stops while maneuvering will deplete pressure in the main engine start bottles. This may lead to the engine failing to start with consequent loss of navigational control at critical times. It is important that the start air pressure is monitored while the ship is being maneuvered. Insufficient or ineffective maintenance of electronic and pneumatic control systems, loss of control air pressure, loss of lubrication, engine automated shutdown or even slowdown at a critical time, shaft and intermediate bearing failure, stand tube bearing failure, control equipment failures, governor failures, defective trips for high temperature cooling or low loop oil pressures, electrical failure, for instance, overload, reverse power trip or preferential trip device failure, mechanical failure, for example, lack of compression, engine seizure, loss of lubrication, overheating, etc. Fuel oil issue, blocked filters, failure to bleed the standby filter before putting back in use, poor quality, for instance, water in fuel, fuel supply piping and pump failures, fuel starvation, loss of air control supply to fuel tank valves and insufficient attention to proper fuel changeover procedure when entering or exiting SECA. And this is our focus today because I've seen many comments in my videos and other channel videos about 
the cause of the power loss on board Dali. One has been repeated a couple of times, which is the fuel oil turnover. As usual, let's discuss the regulations that govern this so we can understand why this may lead to a blackout. But before that, if you are not subscriber yet, please consider doing so. And if you like the video so far, hit the thumbs up and comment what are the other causes that may lead to the blackout on board Dali. The Marpol Convention was adopted in 1973 at IMO, International Maritime Organization. The Protocol of 1978 was adopted in response to a spate of tanker accidents. The winter of 1976 to 1977 was bad time for oil spills in the United States. In short time period, there were multiple major oil spills, including the tanker Argo merchants ran aground on December 15, 1976, and later broke apart off Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, spilling 7.6 million gallons of heavy fuel oil. The tanker Sansinina exploded in Los Angeles Harbor, California, on December 17, 1976, spilling 1.3 million of gallons of heavy oil. Nine crew were killed and 46 people were injured. On January 17, 1977, the tanker Irini's Challenger, loaded with 9.6 million gallons of crude oil, broke apart and sank near Midway Island in North Pacific Ocean. On February 26, 1977, the tanker Hawaiian Patriot broke apart and sank off Hawaii, spilling 31 million gallons of crude oil. This little-known incident is still considered the largest tanker spill in United States waters. So Marpol was adopted after this accident and currently includes six technical annexes. Regulations for the prevention of pollution by oil, regulations for the control of pollution by noxious liquid substance in bulk, prevention of pollution by harmful substances carried by sea in packaged form, prevention of pollution by sewage from ships, prevention of pollution by garbage from ships, and Annex 6, prevention of air pollution from ships. It sets limits on sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide emissions from ship exhaust and prohibits deliberate emissions of ozone-depleting substances. Let's discuss them in details. The ship's emissions specifically include SOx, NOx, ODS, and VOCs. Sulfur oxide, SOx, at high concentration, it can harm trees and plants by damaging foliage and decreasing growth. It can contribute to acid rain, which can harm sensitive ecosystems. Nitrogen oxide, NOx, nitrous acid forms nitrate salts, thus NOx and its derivative exist and react either as gases in the air, as acid in droplets of water, or as salt. These gases, acid gases, and salts together contribute to pollution effects that have been observed and attributed to acid rain. Ozone-depleting substances, ODS. Another important linkage involves the way that ozone-depleting substances and greenhouse gases alter certain processes in the atmosphere so as to enhance both global warming and stratospheric ozone depletion. Volatile organic compounds. VOCs indirectly contribute to global warming by changing the concentration of ozone, which is a strong greenhouse gas. Organic pollutants can also have adverse effects on the environment. The water can become contaminated, trees and grassland can die or be affected, causing more problems with the wildlife. Organic pollutants are also able to affect the food chain through the process of biomagnification. Annex 6 contains provisions for two sets of emission and fuel quality requirements. A global requirements where sulfur content in fuel oil must be less than 0.5% and more stringent controls in special emission control area where sulfur content in fuel oil must be less than 0.1%. Emission control area ECA or sulfur emission control area SECA are sea areas in which stricter controls were established to minimize airborne emissions from ships. And this brings us to our case. There are four existing emission control area. The Baltic Sea, the North Sea, the North American Emission Control Area, including most of the US and Canadian coast, and the US Caribbean Emission Control Area. Also other areas include by particular countries before entering to their port or territory. Some local laws regarding air pollution are more stringent than those let down by the IMO. For example, in Europe, while the ship is at the port, all the running machinery consuming fuel must use only the type of fuel having less than 0.1 sulfur content. 
So when the vessel is staying worldwide using fuel oil with 0.5% sulfur content, the crew members must change over to fuel oil with 0.1% sulfur content before entering the ECA area, and vice versa. When they are sailing within the ECA area using 0.1 sulfur content fuel oil, they change over to 0.5 sulfur content fuel oil when they exit the emission control area. Considering that most of the ships today run at high sulfur fuel oil, changing over of fuel at the right time is very important. Moreover, looking at today's economic condition of the industry, it is imperative to change over the fuel from the high to low sulfur at the correct time, as a nearly change over will lead to loss of low sulfur fuel, which is quite expensive, whereas a delay in the changeover procedure will lead to violation of MARPOL. When leaving the port within SECA, the changeover must be completed once the vessel is clear from this area. Changeover before that time will lead to MARPOL violation. The changeover procedure must include the recording of every action and onboard oil quantity as proof of doing the job correctly. So why the changeover can lead to blackout or loss of power? This procedure involves switching from a tank with 0.1% fuel oil to a tank with 0.5% fuel oil. During this process, there are many steps to be followed to allow safe transition, such as opening and closing valves, etc. Any wrong step, blocked filters, failure to bleed the standby filter before putting it back in use, fuel supply piping and pump failures, loss of air control supply to fuel tank valves, etc can lead to fuel oil not supplied to the engine, therefore the blackout happens. If this is the cause of power loss, why they did it before leaving the emission control area? So either to save money. Fuel oil with maximum sulfur of 0.1% is called ULSFO, ultra low sulfur fuel oil. And the cost of one ton is around 850 US dollar, depending on the global market. Fuel oil with maximum sulfur of 0.5% is called VLSF, very low sulfur fuel oil. And the cost of one ton is around 600 US dollar. Or save quantity for the next voyage and avoid bunkering again, so save time as well. Or they were about to run out of ULSFO, so they had to change over a bit earlier. These ships consume around 130 ton fuel oil per day. If the vessel stays two days in emission control area, then at least 260 ton is required to transit the area excluding the impalpable quantity. If we talk about saving money, then they may save 200 US dollar times 260 ton, which is 52,000 US dollar. But the consequences are severe for such act. As per the US Code, Chapter 33, Paragraph 1908, Penalties for Violation. A person who knowingly violates the MARPOL protocol commits a class D felony. A class D felony will provide a sentence between 5 and 10 years, a maximum fine of 250,000 and up to 3 years of supervised release. So as per the US Code, a person who is found to have violated the MARPOL protocol should be liable to the United States for a civil penalty, not to exceed 25,000 for each violation, or made a false or fraudulent statement or representation in any matter in which a statement or representation should be liable to the United States for civil penalty, not to exceed 5,000 for each statement or representation. Each day of continued violation should constitute a separate violation. So if they sail two days in emission control area, then the captain and all the person in charge are liable to up to 30,000 times two, which is 60,000 US dollar, and sentenced up to 10 years. This is if they are caught in normal condition, not causing the death of six people and collapsing a bridge worth billions. So no one with rightful mind will risk himself to this sentence and penalties. You may check out my previous two videos about the Baltimore Bridge collapse, the full story and the four facts you don't know about the accidents. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.